Hello again, everybody. My name is Dr. Jacob Gran, and in this video, we're going to learn about pedal points. These happen when a composer holds on to one note, usually in the bass voice, while some sort of chord progression plays out on top of the pedal point. And the friction between the moving chord progression and the stationary pedal leads to some of the spiciest dissonance in 18th century music. Not all long, held notes are pedal points, though. There must be a progression of different chords clashing against the pedal point. So, for instance, even though the prelude to Wagner's Das Rheingold features an E-flat in the bass that lasts 136 measures, that still does not count as a pedal point under this definition, because it only features one E-flat major triad for that whole duration. This special effect originated on the pedals of the organ, performed by the organist's feet, which is why it is called a pedal point, or sometimes an organ point. Pedal points most commonly occur in high-style church music, or in serious, elevated genres like the fugue. You would not expect to find pedal points used in simple or unassuming compositions, like a gallant-style sonata or a dance movement. Here is an example by C.P.E. Bach of a pedal point built on the dominant, followed by one built on the tonic. Now, Bach admits that these figured bass symbols are completely impractical, and in his opinion, composers should not expect the continuo player to be able to correctly realize the figured bass written over pedal points during a live performance. The figures are just always going to be too complicated. Instead, scores often included the indication tasto solo, meaning that the accompanist should just play the written bass part and not try to harmonize the bass line. Bach then shows the figured bass symbols rewritten, but instead of measuring the intervals from the pedal point, he measures them against the lowest moving part. This version uses much more familiar chord symbols and is a better description of what is really going on in terms of the moving chords that clash against the pedal point. Notice that this chord progression has correct voice leading even without the pedal point. For this reason, Bach and many other 18th and 19th century authors argued that there isn't much point in adding figures to pedal points to begin with, since it only leads to more confusion. Pedal points are typically found in three locations that happen to be the same as the most important large-scale harmonic functions in a piece of music. We can place a pedal point on scale degree 1 at the beginning of a piece in order to expand and exaggerate the initial tonic harmonic function. This serves to cement the tonic clearly in the listener's ears, so that when we modulate later on in the piece, we have a firm sense of a stable beginning before departing for other key areas. An initial tonic pedal also communicates to the listener that this piece is going to be a serious, high style of work. Pedal points placed on scale degree 5 usually occur over the cadential dominant at the final perfect authentic cadence near the end of the piece. This cadential dominant reorients the listener to the tonic key, but by expanding and exaggerating this dominant harmonic function, we delay the resolution of the cadence for sometimes several measures. This can be an extremely dramatic way to build a purely tonal sense of anticipation and expressive tension. Finally, we can place a pedal point on the final tonic at the perfect authentic cadence near the end of the piece. This type of tonic pedal has the opposite effect of the one built on the cadential dominant. Instead of building up anticipation, this tonic pedal dissipates the tension 
and acts like a kind of cushion or a denouement. Let's look at some musical examples of pedal points in each of these functional locations. This very famous prelude from J.S. Bach's G major cello suite begins with a four-measure pedal over the initial tonic. There isn't a perfectly standard way to label and analyze pedal points, so I'm going to show you a few different ways of doing it. The figuration of this prelude places neighbor notes on the fourth sixteenth note twice in each measure, which I will place in parentheses so that we don't mistake them for chord tones. In order to show that all four measures express an expansion of the tonic function, I will indicate a Roman numeral 1 placed above the functional label T for tonic. Then above that, I'm going to place Roman numerals in parentheses that indicate the chord progression that moves above the pedal point. Notice that these chords don't have inversion symbols since the pedal point provides the base for all of them, and that they form their own little tonic, predominant, dominant tonic harmonic cadence. Let's listen. A different method for analyzing pedal points was developed by Heinrich Schenker, although admittedly this type of figured bass notation never became completely standard even among Schenkerians. We can use figured bass symbols to keep track of the moving voices above our pedal point, and we can connect these symbols to one another with diagonal lines and slurs to indicate different kinds of voice leading motions. I'm still going to include the Roman numeral of the passing chords in parentheses, although Schenker rarely did this. These figured bass symbols take place over two different systems, so I'm going to use a little diagram in the corner to neatly summarize the voice leading. Stepwise connections are indicated with diagonal lines. We can notice that the tenor line in this passage moves by stepwise motion from the chordal fifth D in measure 1 to the root of the chord G, an octave above the bass in measure 4. A large scale passing motion like this one can be indicated with a slur. In this way, the passing dissonance seventh in measure 3 is justified as a passing dissonance. In the top voice, we connect the adjacent figures of a fourth in measures 2 and 3 with another slur this time not to indicate a passing motion, but to indicate a suspension dissonance. The interval that initiates the slur is the preparation. Recall from the video on anticipation chords that the fourth is the only dissonant interval that is permitted to be used as a preparation for a suspension in strict counterpoint. The dissonant suspension itself is shown on the other end of the slur and a diagonal line is used to show the resolution of the suspension down by step. Let's listen to the opening pedal point again, but this time focusing on the large-scale voice leading connections, especially the stepwise ascent in the tenor. Here is another example of an initial tonic pedal. Here, Beethoven's repetition of the Ds in the bass is actually a blending of the high style serious pedal point with the drones that are commonly found in European folk music. That is one of the ways that he sets the pastoral mood of this sonata. I'm not going to annotate this one. You can do it yourself in either of the styles shown previously if you want practice. Cadential dominant pedals can be extremely fun. 
This one is from the same cello prelude that we looked at a moment ago. The dominant function begins at the top of the page and is elaborated first with a stepwise descending bass line moving from the root of the chord to the fifth, but never really losing sight of the dominant harmony. Then Bach begins a pedal point on A in an inner voice, A being the chordal fifth of the dominant harmony. Now this points out two important points. First, pedals don't always have to occur in the bass voice. In this case, the string technique is known as bariolage, or cross-fingering on the open A string. Second, a pedal point does not need to be constructed on the root of a harmony. Bach manages to project a sense of the D major triad, even with a pedal point that uses the chordal fifth. Several measures later, the bass pedal returns, this time with rising chromatic passing tones. At this moment, we finally reach a high G, scale degree 1, harmonized as part of a 6-4 chord. But the dominant pedal point continues across this seeming point of arrival, and the dominant function does not completely resolve until the very last measure. Let's listen to this excerpt, and if you listen in the same way that I do, you may need to remind yourself to breathe every once in a while. Rather than annotating the entire passage, let's just zoom in on the final five measures. Since the figuration pattern is very similar to the opening of the prelude, we can list the Roman numerals and chord figures with the same kind of analytic notation that we used earlier. We can compare the figures above this dominant pedal to the analysis of the tonic pedal, and we will notice something interesting. The intervals 3rd, 4th, 4th, 3rd, recur in the top voice over both passages. This motivic connection would be very hard to notice or describe using Roman numerals alone, which is why I wanted to include the more detailed figured bass analysis. Melodic motives are often used to give a design to the dissonance over pedal points. For instance, the final pedal points of a fugue will often include a partial or complete statement of the fugue subject, pretty much no matter what kind of dissonances that will result. Now let's move on to pedal points built on the final tonic. As I stated earlier, these pedals are used as a kind of denouement, and this one in particular, from Bach's C-sharp minor fugue in the first book of the Well-Tempered Clavier, is a great example of dissonances spilling over from the preceding dominant pedal, sort of like the gears of a train grinding to a halt. The suspension chord occurring above the first beat of the tonic pedal is especially crunchy. Don't worry about understanding my figured bass analysis perfectly. First, because every pedal point is different. And secondly, there's no perfectly standardized way of analyzing pedal points, as far as I am aware of. This is a five-voice fugue, so there are four moving voices above the pedal point, so the figures are especially complicated. The things worth pointing out are the dashed slurs near the end that I'm using to show a neighboring chord, and the Roman numerals in parentheses that show a complete 1-5-1 one, one progression in the key of the subdominant. This kind of tonicization of the subdominant during a final tonic pedal is pretty typical, 
and it merges with the convention of a raised scale degree 3 for a Picardy third at the final cadence. Finally, I do not want to leave you with the false impression that these three typical placements of the pedal point are the only locations possible. Pedals also occur in secondary keys to confirm a modulation, or in the middle of a developmental passage as a way to give the listener a sense of order. My favorite example of an irregular pedal point comes from the beginning of Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto. He builds his pedal point on the subdominant as a way of exaggerating a giant plagal resolution to the tonic. That's all for this video. Stay tuned for the next one when we will discuss a full analysis of a Bach's C major prelude from the first book of the Well-Tempered Clavier. Bye for now.